found his red bags. While he was his man, he brought this image to us. His friends and his family say he's the guy they can trust. He saw some things on Love Creek that he couldn't explain. Now he's all over the front page. What was his name? Jerry Crew. He knew what to do. Jerry Crew. Oh, some of the names in my butt a few. That didn't stop Jerry. Cause he knew what to do Yeah, he knew what to do They closed. Well, he was snatched up in his sleeping bag with his old Albert nose. He woke up in a bundle he couldn't grab for his knife. The Albert Osman was in for the ride of his life. Hey, Albert, oh, Albert, what did you see? Them Sasquatch made you one of the family. Albert, oh, Albert, what do you say? You not only saw Sasquatch. You got carried away. This is ours. Please. He was carried up and over. Three ways it seemed. If he wasn't in such pain, he would have thought it was a dream. He got dumped in a heap, and he rolled to a stop. And when he opened his eyes, well, his jaw had just dropped. There standing before him was a family of four And no, my dear friends, it wasn't the family next door It was four hairy giants and they gave off a smell Now what else would have been carried to where the Sasquatch did dwell? When he was trapped in a small valley, he made the best of his stay He watched the dad sit around while the kids they did play They had a bed of moss and leaves, he had his knapsack and boots he dined on cold hash, and they dined on sweet roots. Well, they look very much like us, except they were covered in hair. But their feet, hands, and fingernails did rightly compare. The swore it was wild men, and they used language or tools. Not these were the Sasquatch, they didn't fit any rules. Yeah, Albert, oh, Albert, what did you see? Them Sasquatch made you one of the family. Albert, oh, Albert, what do you 
say you're not only some Sasquatch, you got carried away. Strong for six days, and Albert said that's enough. You can make the big one sick by feeding him snuff. Well, he rolled in the can, and Daddy B ate it all. Well, Albert grabbed up his things and ran for that hole in the wall. When now he shot over the mama, he tried to halt his escape. He ran as fast as he could to get free from them apes. Well, after two days, he found some waters. They said, What happened to you? When they thought about telling them, they never believed it was true. So Albert went home, t'was 1924. He kept that tale to himself for 30 years or more. And then he talked to John Green, God has weak there in hell. He made a swear for the judge, it was the truth he did tell. Well, he went looking for some gold to enrich his life. But when he almost ended up with a hairy Bigfoot wife So if you go out here, don't know where he did go Or you might just stand up like old Albert O Oh, Albert O, Albert, what did you see? Them Sasquatch made you one of the family Albert O, Albert, what did you say? You not only saw Sasquatch you got carried away. Hey, Albert, oh, Albert, what did you see? Them Sasquatch made you one of the family. Albert, oh, Albert, what did you say? You not only saw Sasquatch, you got carried away.
I don't remember when I just first heard of or, or read this story, but I do know that both Randy and and myself did pay attention to it. That was a while we are. There we are. <laughs> and uh, then what happened is that an experienced radio news reporter came up to this area just to see me because he was in considerable confusion. He put it if he had interviewed Osman, and if Osman wasn't telling the truth, he didn't know if he had ever interviewed anyone who was. It was just about his exact word. So then we went to talk to Osman, and uh, he proved to be a delightful personality. And, uh, you know, there's nothing obvious. Indicating that he would be a storyteller other than the nature of the story. And I took the local magistrate who had been a uh, defense counsel before he retired to Arizona, uh, who cross examined him in a way that left me feeling very awkward and embarrassed that I had subjected this philosophy. It didn't, it didn't phase him a bit. He told his story. And on a later occasion, I took the Eris Swindler, the, the author of the Atlas of Comparative Anatomy of Ape and Human, and uh, also the veterinarian from the Federal Primate Center at the University of Washington, who, who was also the uh, veterinarian for the big apes of the Seattle Zoo. And these two experts questioned Osman for half an afternoon. And then we went to coffee afterwards. They said, well, if he didn't have this experience, he must have had a period in his life when he really had an opportunity to observe great apes because he had never said anything that didn't make sense. So that's one side of the picture. The other side is that nobody, including myself, has been able to relate the actual geography where he said he went into the bush to the location where he went out of it. That the story would require this creature who would carry him up, up and down over several mountain ranges in the course of part of the night. Oh, and the other, the other significant thing is that Osman wasn't alone in this, but he was going totally against the uh, common understanding of Sasquatch, which was well known in this area, and uh, was supposed to be a, a giant Indian with long hair, where he's you know, describing something totally different. And, uh, there's just so much detail in what he says. I can't go very far into it. But I don't know, and I don't think we will ever know, but that he was able to uh, construct a, a detailed picture that through the years, either that's what these things are, or everybody since has been copying Austria. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah, there's uh, been a lot of uh, discrepancies in regards to uh, reports for his story, uh, basically on his opportunity for escape. Did he elaborate on that with you, and can you elaborate on that with us? I didn't catch all of that. Uh, yes, there's been different, different reports of what happened and how he was able to escape. I'm just wondering if he told you the actual story of how he escaped so that... Oh, he, his entire story was written. Uh, another man... You have to realize that at this time there was a big fuss going on about the South Park. And there were so many stories 
that the two daily newspapers in Vancouver were each listing Sasquatch on their front page index. And, and one of these people that had, had ended his story by saying he didn't know what these were. And Osman got in touch with this man and said he knew what they were. So then this man arranged for the newspaper somebody to come and interview Osman and they told him that this person was coming. So Osman sat down and tried to reconstruct everything he could remember and, and wrote it all out in the book. So that's where the, the story you read comes from. And, uh, well, I kind of lost my way as to what I should be answering. <laughs> John, you can describe uh, your first viewing of the Patterson Gimlin film and uh, the kind of excitement there was surrounding that. And then also, uh, this next year, when you went down to film with the comparison movie you made, could you talk a bit about the 1967? Well, when they, we got word that, uh, I actually forget how that happened even. Oh, no, I came, I heard from the British Columbia Museum, whom uh, Roger had contacted because he wanted them uh, to have some tracking dogs brought down. And uh, I've forgotten now how arrangements but anyway, I knew that the film had been sent to Roger Patterson's brother-in-law and uh, went to his house on the day when we knew about that Roger was returning. The brother-in-law already had the film and had been showing it in a cheap projector that had scratched the things out of it. And uh, he didn't show it to, to us Jim McLaren was there as well, I know. And Renee, of course, and myself. But uh, he waited until Roger showed up and then showed it to Roger, who, of course, didn't know what he had on his film at that point. And then we were invited to come down and see him, uh, showing it in the downstairs <coughs> restaurant. And uh, actually, uh, it was quite surprising to me because the first time I saw the footprint sinking this deep into hard sand, it was a shock. A real good Lord, there's something happening here. There is something to this. But when I saw the movie, I had no reaction at all. I just, oh yeah, there, there is one. Mm -hmm. You got a picture of one. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, we were, oh, and we expected, uh, we knew we had some, set, had some footprint casts, and Renee and I had just been down in California six weeks before and come back with casts of the, what we call the 15-inch print and the 13-inch print. And, uh, we naturally expected that what he would show us would be, you know, which ones are going to be. And, uh, my friend, Dr. Melbourne, notwithstanding, it wasn't either of them. <laughs> it was a print we'd never seen, and we'd seen a lot of prints of the 15. And, um, on that one occasion, a great many prints of the 13 also. And then uh, afterwards, when we were discussing this, uh, there was this little yellow Kodak box, I think you probably all remember, that was it's just sitting there on the table. And Rene had one with some of his film in it, and I've wondered ever since why he didn't just switch. Wanya, who was Rene's wife at the time, was probably laughing at that hard. <laughs> but, uh, okay, again, I, see, I have almost no memory left. There was more to that question. <laughs> 
How involved were you with the William Rowe story? I never met William Rowe because he moved away very shortly after. Uh -huh. But when I was mis mistakenly had the idea that sworn statements would help in getting scientists to pay some attention to this, uh, I wrote to him. And uh, he went to the trouble of going to an official in, in Edmonton and uh, having his story sworn to. And he also had his daughter draw the picture that I think most of you must have seen in the book somewhere. Mm -hmm. Sent that to me. Um, but I never met him, never spoke to him. Uh, I did, on a later occasion when I was traveling across Canada selling my books, uh, encountered in two different cities two different scientists that I went to see who said that they had regularly corresponded with William Rowe about Buffalo and that he was an excellent observer of wildlife. Mm -hmm. so, but as I say, I have nothing personal to recall. Well, somebody had a hand up with this adjusting their camera. <laughs> I, I just wondered, when did you meet Ivan Sanders and how did you and Ivan Sanders get together? Ivan was writing a book about North American ecology and traveling around the United States. And somebody sent him a clipping of a magazine article based on what I'd been doing. As a result of which, he took a side trip to Willow Creek to talk about the big footprints. And then he came up to see me at my home. That's the only time I was ever with him, but I took him to see Osman and, and uh, to see the Chapmans from the Ruby Creek site. Um, uh, he was involved in us getting together with Tom Slick. We, we had the idea that if Slick was financing uh, uh, research in the Himalayas into the Bob on the snowman, maybe he would finance us. And we knew that Sanderson knew him, so and this is all very blurred now, I think it's 50 years ago. But, uh, Sanderson was, was greatly involved. Well, I think he was officially the scientific part of, of the, what was called at Slick's insistence, the uh, Pacific Northwest Expedition. It wasn't in the Pacific Northwest, and it was an expedition where other people were picking berries. But uh, anyway, that's what <laughs> it, it has a fame now out of all proportion to anything it was ever, ever actually there. And, and then after Slick brought Peter Byrne over, that was the end of that. And <laughs> real research went on from then on. So I think it went over there. <laughs> 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 did I answer what you wanted? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Yeah. John, one of the many wonderful things I find in your book, from a science perspective, was the structured interviews you did and accumulated the database where not just a bunch of stories, but consistency of characteristics that you cleared about. How did you decide to do that? Did you come up with that on your own or suggest it? I think that's the natural thing to do when you're trying to, to learn about something. I think it's a monumental contribution for you. I think one of the chapters you have, which you call, I think it's titled, What is a Sasquatch? Where you go through sort of the cross classification. It's just a wonderful piece of science writing. Yeah, I, I used to uh, put things on uh, file cards in the beginning. Not right in the beginning. The beginning was totally unstructured. Gradually. Make a file card for each instant in a new environment. I'm saving them loosely. Find their detail what they had. Then I started putting things on maps. The markers on the map weren't just pins and you know, number, size, time of day. A lot of stuff you could just, if you had the key to it, you could read up the map. And then when the computer age came in, actually before the computer age, they had something called the American National Enterprise that wanted to get a Sasquatch movie for, uh, of their own. And they were negotiating with Roger, the director of the site. And I uh, wanted to do a computer survey, so I, I handled that. 
Do you think you paid a price for that? Do you think you paid a price? No, for I had a ball. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is real. <laughs> 